G'day, I'm Jim Begley from Gone Broken Catchment Management Authority. We have a biodiversity fund project in the Gone Broken Catchment uh, on seed production areas and our project is about uh, putting back fragmented populations of shrub species in our, in our landscape. I guess 200 years ago, uh, with clearing over that time, uh, our populations of shrub species, native shrub species, have um, been fragmented. And today it's our role to try to put the genetics back together. We want to put genetic diversity of species back into our revegetation projects. Just like to go and speak to some of the people who are involved in our project. Hi, I'm Liz Evans. I'm the seed bank coordinator for the Golden Broken Indigenous Seed Bank. Um, we collect seed for the Golden Broken catchment. We also have seed production areas set up throughout the catchment, um, which we harvest seed from, um, and those seed production areas are set up for genetic diversity. Um, we bring the seed back here and we clean it and process it. The seed bank started in 2001 and we've revegetated over 5,000 hectares worth of land since that um, time. I think, yes, my word. That's a good idea. It's all sieved. We can turn up like that. This is all sieved out. Well, my role in this whole collaborative process is to um, collect the seed from remnant populations and um, so that they can be grown on for in the seed production areas here at the Arboretum. And I guess our part when we take over from getting the seed in um, is to try and grow a diversity of from each of those populations so we try and make sure that we've got it well documented where the seeds come from each of the labels that we have in our for our plants has got an indication on it with a number which will give us where the population of seeds come from so that we can make sure that when we're putting in seed into the ground that we have as diverse a range of plants as we can so that's part of our, our role we feel is to make sure that we can maintain diversity out in the paddock as well. Yeah. So finding those wild, wild populations is my biggest challenge because I have to drive kilometres and kilometres between plants to collect enough seed and to find healthy pop, remnant populations out across the Longwood Plains is getting harder and harder and those populations are declining a bit in their health so that's why we need the seed production areas to get any quantity of seed because it's not available out in the wild anymore. Silver banksias were once really common across the Strathbogie ranges and through here but due to clearing and farming and things the population has really dropped off and there's nine known sites where they actually grow and some of those sites might only contain one or two plants uh, and they're very dispersed all over the the whole of the Strathbogie ranges and out across the plains so we've got a project here at the Arboretum to bring seedlings from all those plants together so that they can cross pollinate in a seed production area that we see out the back here and my role has been to go out to those parent plants and collect the seed and bring it in so that it can be propagated here and used in the seed production area. Um, over the years that I've been doing it, I've noticed a distinct decline in the health of the remnant populations of those trees, and quite a few have died in the recent dry spell. So it's really lucky we've got this deposit of the genetic material here that we can mm. do research from and things like that. So we're only just finding that now this sun to germinate, so it might just be the time of year that seems to be the, the trigger mm. with them. Um, and we're getting reasonable numbers now, but yeah, we're still uh, questioning as to how, how effective our genetic 
material is that we actually have on site here and if it still is robust enough to be um, viable for the next round of silver banks here going out across the landscape. So glass in Tabasina which is a beautiful little plant as you can see um, it's a little pea um, the reason or the, the idea with this is the glycine is almost impossible to collect in the field. It has um, these little pods. Yeah. Actually, I missed the pod there. And it, it sheds its seeds really quickly, doesn't it? It zings. So as it ripens, like it ripens at different times. This has been ripening at, almost from February and it's continued to ripen right through now. And as that seed pod dries, it sort of pops. And as it pops, it shoots its seeds out. So it's got a real sort of zing with the seed. And the problem with that in the field is, for one, you're only getting one or two of these pods that are ripe at any one time. And two, if you collect them, quite often they zing off in your hand. And you're only really getting very few seeds at any one time. And that one, even still, is, is almost empty. It's been predated a little bit. So we've only got a couple of worthwhile seeds. So you can imagine if you're collecting that out in the field. Yeah, and how far would it be between plants? You might have to drive. It's Pitiful, yeah, absolutely yeah. pitiful. You know, so you a, never good, get the quantity a good course. day's collection might be that much, would you reckon, Janet? Like the palm yeah. of your hand <laughs> would be an exceptional day's collection. So, you know, before if you'd collected, I don't know, 20 grams was quite is quite a big deal. But now we're so how many different wild people. populations are represented here? Um, I think we have of the glycines. We might have six populations. We also have behind us we've got a Desmodium as well which is quite rare and there's only four populations of that however that again is a really difficult species that tends to drop at periodic points so you know it starts to seed in December and will continue in fact it's still got seed on it now so it's got such a long seeding period and in the wild you would be very lucky to have once again a handful and most years we can collect up to six kilos of this seed so it's a significant amount of seed that we can collect from difficult species and it is starting to go out into direct seeding projects now isn't it? Yeah it is. So it's starting to be used in, in, in the wild again, released. And I wild. guess the bonus with them is they're low, they're difficult to collect but they add such incredible diversity to our ground layer and they're really important as a pea because they're adding nitrogen as well into our soils. So seed production areas such as the one at Golden Broken can provide um, really high quali quality um, seed sources that are genetically diverse and this diversity is really important for um, providing new populations with all that adaptive potential that they're probably going to require as they try and adapt to um, changing environments. So, changes such as um, in the climate or water availability and um, other environmental changes like that. My main motivation, I suppose, was getting to know the local plants across this district. Over a number of years, I realised there are an extraordinary number of rare plants um, with very small populations. So I started collecting seed from those species and growing them. And the main idea for setting up the seed production area was to make that seed available more widely to get it back into the environment. The Eutaxia here is not particularly rare in the district, but it's a really common component of the understory and in fact is easy to establish in direct seeding. One of the things I did want to do with that species was uh, grow different provenances together to increase the genetic diversity of the seed that was going out into revegetation. I notice you've got uh, kangaroo proof fencing. Has that been very important for the success of this project? Yeah, <laughs> couldn't have done it without it. Um, it's also rabbit and hare proof. Um, there's actually a really big um, herbivore problem right through this area. Um, kangaroo grazing is actually having a really negative impact on the understory that's left in the district. And this was the only way we could cope in a localised sense growing these species. The other benefit of having a kangaroo proof fence is, it's, is that all these other interesting things have come up in the seed production area. So this was an area of 90% phalaris probably. It had been sown down before we bought the property. Um, so we've done a lot of herbiciding to get rid of that. 
but one of the nice benefits is a whole lot of native grasses have come up inside this enclosure um, and it's popular with quail so that's rather nice. <laughs> Well, I've been buying seed from the seed bank for probably 10 years now and I thought it would be a good opportunity to use what land I've got that I'm not using for agriculture anymore to grow my own seed and to give back into the system as well. That's great. How many species do you have here, John? Uh, in this paddock, there's, uh, in the seed production area, there's probably 15. Behind that I have a direct seeding project which I collect seed off as well. Uh, there's, there's new varieties coming up regularly on that. I, because it was a direct seeding job I don't know what's still in the ground. But that's ongoing. And I'm hoping to fill in the gaps here where we've lost some through the very wet summer we had two years ago. So the whole place now is out of the 93 acres I've got about 85 to conservation projects, so I'm noticing a change every day really. This is my uh, direct seeding project, it was done at the same time as the seed production area which they, they were planted by hand. This was just direct seeded and within 15 days uh, I got species coming up and since then it's just gone crazy. It's uh, home to uh, three wallabies and um, probably half a dozen kangaroos at any one time. There's numerous birds uh, that visit this. A lot of parrots come here um, and I'm just very pleased with the way this has happened and it fits in again with what I'm doing on the other side of the fence on the creek project.